So not all microcontroller development is in C or C++, so I'll be very interested to see what Nick has to say about use of MicroPython. So thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, yeah, good day, everyone. Um, my name's Nick. Uh, I'm a consultant. I work with large computers a long way away most of the time, so it's kind of fun on the weekends to work with very, very tiny computers that fit in your pocket. Um, but C, I mean, C is a, an interesting and exciting language, as a lot of you have, have, would know and have seen. Um, but it's not a relaxing language in a lot of ways. And if you write C, you often find yourself coming back to C code you wrote and went going, who wrote this? This is insane. I don't even know what this does anymore. And as anyone who's followed computer security knows, C and its, its lovely memory management, or lack of, tends to lead to very, very, makes it very, very easy to make mistakes, to have buffer overruns, to forget about deallocating memory, to do the wrong thing. And so one of the really exciting things that, that I've been really excited about in the 8266 is that we've finally gotten these systems on a chip to the point where they work well with interpreted languages and more interesting languages, certainly easier to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis languages, including Python. Um, I presented about a, uh, MicroPython on ESP8266 at PyCon, and there was a lot of interest there in it, and um, the ESP32 came out, and I managed to actually get hold of some of them, and was talking to Damien George, who is the original kind of creator of MicroPython on the PyBoard platform and so on, and we managed to scratch together a, a, a bit of a plan to get it running on ESP32 platform, which has been successful. It's very, very early days, but it's kind of exciting. So I wanted to come along today and share that with you guys. Um, so ESP32 modules, we've, we did a bit of an introduction this morning with Gus, um, but I'll just very, very quickly zip through that again in case anyone wasn't here this morning. Um, very nice little system on a chip. Uh, originally that, that 8266 chip came to prominence as a a coprocessor, a network interface for something like a, an AVR Arduino type based thing um, until someone finally read the spec sheet and realised it was several times as powerful as the thing it was helping. Um, and the relationship kind of got turned around a little bit at that point. Um, they've risen to prominence as a development platform largely because of the, the way that the, the company, Espressive, to their immense credit, have embraced the enthusiast world and the open source world. Uh, it's, it's been a really great platform to work on. And they've taken a lot of the feedback they've got from that world and gone another step further. So where the 8266 was a bit of a leap ahead from the existing uh, systems on a chip in the market, the 32 has just done another jump forward. We've now got multiple CPU cores, we've got far better I.O. Uh, we've got higher clock rates. We've got this really cool ultra low power processor off to the side. It's some brilliant stuff has gone into this platform. Um, so yeah, there's now a networking stack that does uh, all of the 802.11 stuff, or, or 2.4 gigahertz stuff. Uh, Bluetooth, um, lots of support for wired networking as well, which is great. Uh, and the I.O. is incredibly flexible and there is so much stuff there that I haven't even gotten to scrape the the really look at it all. And it's um, amazing just how many things I managed to pack onto that one little silicon die. Uh, the IDF is the, the software development kit for this platform. It's a really nice load of, of C code and fairly readable, much to my surprise. Um, building through a GCC tool chain using extensive architecture and all that sort of stuff. It's actually quite easy to work with. And you guys have, have been playing with it as an Arduino thing or as a, um, as a C thing and so on. Um, it contains uh, L LWIP, which is a quite a lightweight network stack. Um, and that's made it quite easy for us now to bring that network stack through to Python. Um, MicroPython. So MicroPython was basically a, a re-implementation of Python, about 3.4 designed to run on very sort of resource constrained, constrained systems. So it uses things like uh, value boxing to squeeze more out of every byte of memory it uses and to get better sort of cache behavior. Um, it is written as close to the metal in C as it can be written. Um, 
there's very little sort of fuzzy abstraction in there and there's a great deal of horrible C macroism, but it's overall a pretty easy platform to develop for. Um, oh, sorry, that was that slide. Huh. The, the distribution of MicroPython is completely MIT licensed, which means that you can take it, you can work with it, you can fork it, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can include it into commercial products, you can develop it further, etc., etc. And that's something I think is really important. If we're going to be saying to hobbyists, this is cool, we can't also be saying to them, but you'll never make a living out of it. Um, so, uh, MicroPython itself was originally written for the Pi board, which is like an ARM uh, architecture. Uh, that's a really cool little piece of hardware that you can buy online from that link if you click on the projector screen. No, wait, if you look at the slides later. Um, it also works on things like 16 bit PICs, the 8266 and the 32. Part of the aim here is that the same piece of Python should run identically on the different platforms, although maybe quicker, uh, hopefully, on the faster ones, uh, and with more I.O. pins. But it should provide a layer of abstraction, so you don't have to rewrite your code. If the code you've written is for, say, a thermostat, a thing with an LED and a button and a knob and a temperature sensor, you shouldn't have to rewrite that software just because you changed the CPU. And so the idea of MicroPython is to give you a little bit of separation there. You can talk about the I.O. pins in a much more abstract way whether it's on a PIC or whether it's on a ESP32. It also gives us a little bit of insulation between your code and the changes that might be happening down at the SDK layer. Um, as Gus mentioned before, um, the SDK is evolving very, very rapidly and very publicly. It's, uh, we're seeing, I think the other day, we had a, a bug filed and someone said, oh, well, I got this problem. And we said, oh, upgrade to the latest SDK or the latest IDF. And he said, I did. And we looked at it and we went, oh yeah, we meant the latest one when we said that, not the latest one now, which has 97 more changes. <laughs> so it's, it's a moving target, but part of the idea is MicroPython helps insulate you a little bit against that moving target. Um, all right, so we actually have a separate repo at the moment for the ESP32 fork of the, the platform. The aim is to eventually merge that back into MicroPython proper and, and do that. Um, so far, there's only support for the basic I.O. pins. You can do a set a digital input or a digital output. Uh, you can talk TCP over IPv4, not UDP, not IPv6. Uh, there is no support for the really cool stuff like capacitive touch sensors and the Hall effect sensor and uh, things like that. But these things are actually really easy to add. And what I mostly want to talk about today, which I'll get to, is how we can add them, how as a community we can come together and actually add stuff in. Because it's not that tricky to do, well, it's tricky, it's not that difficult, it's not vastly theoretical and weird, it's just a matter of saying, this is what the IDF does, this is what Python does, how do I connect the two up? So we'll talk about that in a sec. All right, so how do you run this MicroPython? Great, we've got MicroPython on a controller, there's no keyboard, what do I do? So as you've noticed from these boards, there's a serial connector we can talk serial directly to the board to program it. Once you've loaded up MicroPython, you can also just use that serial port to talk directly to a REPL, to a Python REPL. So anyone who's ever worked with Python would recognise the, the little prompt there. This is saying, here you go, write some Python. And believe it or not, you can actually type directly into your microcontroller. You can type Python code, which is cool. I, I just can't get over that. The minute I did that, exact piece of code pretty much and the little LED turns on you just go, oh wow, this is cool. And because it's Python, it's really easy to just take that next step. You know, so far we've turned an LED on, we type a few more lines, we have Blinky. And all we're doing here is we're saying forever, oh, wrong button, forever, turn the light on, wait a second, turn the light off, wait another second. It's that easy to type stuff in. And you can actually see it immediately, a feedback that it's working, which I just think is fantastic. Um, it's really encouraging. It's a great way if you're a beginner getting into this stuff. It's, it's always very off-putting when someone says, install the tool chain. All right, now compile your code. Oh yeah, did I not mention C syntax? Um, that can be really off-putting to beginners. So I think this is a brilliant, brilliant thing to get beginners kind of sucked into the idea of programming these tiny, tiny little chips. And I think it's great for, educational things as well. Python is one of the easiest languages to learn. Um, 
and it really encourages, I guess, people to just give it a go. Uh, however, typing stuff directly into the console and having it run may seem a little bit retro to you. Perhaps it's a little bit like running an Apple II again. Maybe that's why I like it. I don't know. Uh, thankfully, this is not all you have to do. You don't have to buy MicroPython magazine and type a listing in <laughs> over 14 pages and so on and so forth, which would be a little bad. Um, we could make some kind of modem, I guess, so you could play a cassette tape into it. <laughs> anyway. um, so thankfully, there is a file system on that little chip. Uh, again, this is another thing which if you said to me, oh, yeah, we have a VFAT file system on our microcontroller, I'd go, yeah, yeah, of course you do. Um, <laughs> but, but we do, we do, we actually do. And it has files and it talks basically the same primitives as you used to talking to, to files on uh, from Python. You can open files, you can write to them, you can close them, you can read them again, you can look at directory. There's directories. I find that weird. Um, you can write files into that memory. Now, that's great, but you don't really want to write a program to write a program into memory so that you can have a program when you next boot the thing. That would be a little crazy. So, there is a thing called WebREPL that lets you access that and just transfer files directly. Uh, there is a small amount of, of, of fine print at the bottom of this slide that says not actually working on ESP32 yet. Um, it's not actually working on the ESP32 yet. That's a screenshot from the 8266. Uh, it will be working for the 32 soon. Uh, hey, pull requests welcome. Uh, so the idea with this is that you connect up over a web socket to the device. So now you don't even need to plug it in. Well, to batteries, yes. You can connect up over a web socket and you can transfer files, you can type directly into the REPL, you can combine those things and you can control the device remotely over Wi-Fi. So that's really cool and that will be coming to the 32 soon. Um, the other way you can get files onto it is to use uh, some little programs uh, that I've put up on GitHub called Empire Utils. These are actually really sneaky, horrible things. Uh, they actually connect up to the REPL and they type the commands it would take to write the program into a file into the REPL, and then the REPL runs that and writes the file, which is a little perverse and quite slow, but actually surprisingly well works. And it worked so well when I wrote the uploader that I went, I should really just be stupid about this, and I wrote a fuse mount for it. So you can now mount the file system from your ESP8266 or 32 onto your host system and write files to it at 19200 board. So. <laughs> Be a little patient. But it is kind of nice because it means you can do things like run an SHA1 sum of a file on the device. Uh, you don't need a separate utility to do that. So it means that all of your make and editors and things like that can actually edit stuff directly on the device slowly, but eventually. So that's okay. Um, and again, pull requests welcome. That's, that needs a lot of improvement, a lot of making it more robust and making it retry when it fails and know how to reset the board when it completely fails and things like that. But Work in progress. Okay, so, um, hang on. Ah, right, that's that one. Okay, right, the other way you can get code onto it is in the build directory for MicroPython, there are two subdirectories called modules and scripts. Modules get, or any Python code under modules gets pre-compiled to bytecode and then crammed into the, the actual runtime of Python. Anything under scripts gets just compressed down as Python source and crammed into the runtime. So you can act as if they were files. You can import those modules as Python and things like that. So if you've got a, a big library that you want to always include in your thing, you don't need to upload it and download that to the file system every time. You can build that into your runtime. Uh, and there's a package called upip, which is a micro pip. It's, it's like Python package manager, but for micro Python that will hopefully start to streamline that a bit. It's early days yet, but. All right, under construction, like the web. Um, developing for MicroPython. Uh, it's very early days. There's only really a few people working on this project at the moment. It's not a commercial project, um, although we do have some support. Uh, I think I forgot to mention before we had some support from uh, MicroBrick uh, to get the, the first stages of the 32 port out and previously support came from a Kickstarter campaign that was really successful for, for Damien getting the original version out. Um, but we can't do the development of this thing all alone. We really want other people to contribute. And that's a large part of the reason why I wanted to come down today and talk to everyone. 
was to try and suck you all into doing pull requests and making a contribution. It doesn't have to be just pull requests, though. Even if it's just, oh, I wish it could do this, file a bug. It's actually really helpful. It's actually a really useful contribution to file bugs and to say, I wish it did this, I wish it did that. Have you seen this feature of the ESP IDF? I'd really love it if MicroPython could support that. Filing bugs, starring bugs, adding comments, making suggestions, all of those things are really, really valuable too. And if you go, oh, I've got this thing and I changed this thing and I don't know if I can, I can't really pull request that, that's embarrassing, what if it's not perfect? Just, just PR it anyway, please. Uh, if, if you have any concerns about my code isn't perfect enough to be a pull request, see the previous presentation about imposter syndrome and so on and so forth. It's, it's just, just do it, we will welcome all things, we will give you feedback. Um, we're absolutely welcoming to people giving it a go and worst case scenario is it turns out it's not very good but it still indicates that someone really cares and we can then work with you and improve it. So those are the currently open bugs. There aren't very many of them, which doesn't mean there aren't many bugs. It just means that not many people have filed bugs. All right. There are bugs like doesn't support IPv6, which are obviously a much bigger thing than themselves. All right, so what's in the repo? Uh, who's checked out the repo for this thing in the time it took me to do this talk? You, excellent, <laughs> excellent. The first thing I did when I went, I want to work on this ESP32 port is check out the repo, look at this file directory listing and go, oh, what the hell? What is all this stuff and why is it all here? It's all jumbled in together, and it is. So jumbled in there is a bunch of documentation, examples, tests, things like that. There's, I've just highlighted those. Um, that's all good stuff, have a read, etc., etc. but we can sort of just cross them mentally off our map of the code now. Um, shared, <laughs> so there's also some directories here which are shared between the ports, things like drivers and libraries and ext mods. Uh, they are modules that are across the different ports. So they're not specific to one port of the code, they, they're shared by things. MPyCross, for example, compiles uh, Python down to Python bytecodes and it's used by all of them. Um, and then there's these other directories are individual ports, individual platforms that MicroPython runs on. Um, the one we're most interested in at the moment is ESP32. It's the newest one, which is cool. And if we look in there, we can see that it also has a little layout of files. There's a readme file, which is cool, and a make file, which is cool, and you really do just do make and make deploy and it will compile, hopefully. Um, and there's also these mysterious looking files called mod something. Now before I, I did, uh, I had my little demo and I said import machine, machine.pin5 and then, you know, so on and so forth. Machine is a library a Python library, a Python module. It comes from somewhere, it didn't just get invented. It comes from, in fact, this mod machine up here. Mod machine is a piece of C code that implements the functions required to make Python know what the platform can do. So I just thought I'd run through a quick example of a really, really the simplest possible function in MicroPython to show you how the MicroPython runtime wraps up that ESP IDF function and turns it into a Python function that you can call from the Python mm -hmm. runtime. So this is just an example. The ESP module here um, is a bunch of ESP specific stuff, so specific to the just the ESP platform. It includes a, a function in that module which is called flash size, which is rather boring, but it just tells you the size of the chip that is on, the size of the flash chip that is on your particular module, which is, is a kind of a handy thing to know. Um, and you can call it like a Python function there and it'll turn a, return a number that says it's this many bytes long. It's very, very simple, but it's a great place to start simple and work your way up to things that take var args and God knows what. So where does this thing come from? Well, that's the ESP IDF function declaration, which tells you a few amusing things, such as my description of it before was completely wrong. It actually tells you how big you said the flash was when you compiled the thing. But it basically says this is a function, a C function, takes no parameters and returns a size t, returns a size to say how big the flash chip is. That's the ESP IDF function. As a C programmer, you just call that directly, it gives you a number, that's great. As a Python programmer, how do we, how do we tell Python about this? So the answer is we wrap it up. We have to wrap it up in a Python binding. And so we're just walking through that process here. 
So in that um, mod ESP, you have this declaration. I've sort of cut and pasted little bits out of these files to give you the idea. So we're pulling in that header that says this is, this is where that function's declared. And we're wrapping this thing up here and it says, first of all, well, there's the function we're calling, right? And then we're wrapping that function up in this mp obj new int from uint. What that's doing is it's saying, wrap me up a uint c type into a Python integer type, right? That's literally all that function does. It makes an, a micro Python object in micro Python's little brain, which is just a C structure that represents that one int. And then we declare a little function that returns that object. It says, okay, this is a function that returns a Python object now. And so we've wrapped up our int into a Python, uh, our C int into a Python int, and we return that. How do we call this function from Python? We can't just call this function. This is a C function, not a Python function. So we have to wrap that as well. So we're going to wrap that function up and turn the function now into a Python. We wrap the int into a Python int. Now we're going to wrap the function that returned the int into a Python function. And that's what this thing here does. It's got a great elegant name called mp define const fun obj zero, which to unpack it a little bit just means micro Python define this thing as a constant function. Uh, it's not a function we're going to change. Uh, make it into an object. It takes zero parameters. This is like the simplest possible case. So th there are many more of these that handle var args and handle multiple parameters and things like that. And we say, take that C function there, that flash size function, and wrap it into a flash size function object, which is a micro Python object. I think we're starting to see a little bit of a pattern here. Of course, how does micro Python know where to find that Python function object? It doesn't know where that is. It doesn't know what that is. So we have to wrap that up again. <laughs> so what we do is we say, well, that's a function object. And it, uh, you're familiar with anonymous functions in Python, like lambda functions and things like that, right? They're anonymous functions. You don't know what they are. The only way you can talk to them is to have a variable pointing at them. So let's have a variable pointing at them. This thing here declares a table that says this name points to this function, right? So we say this is our flash size name. Now all this nonsense about mp rom qster, mp qster flash size is literally just, it's interning a string. So it's saying we have a name flash underscore size. We want to be able to talk about that name really efficiently from C. And who here is, is used to C and strings? C is so good with strings. Um, so we intern the strings so that we don't have to deal with them. We don't have to stir comp them every time we want to compare to them. Instead we intern them into an int that C is very good at dealing with. Um, and that's what that stuff's about. Honestly, just cargo cult this stuff. If you want to contribute to this code and you go, I don't understand this stuff at all, I just cut and paste this from other functions and we'll go, yeah, that worked, okay, that's cool. That's how it works. Um, and so we say, all right, the name flash size now points to that function object we had before, right? So we now have a name pointing at a function object. It's in a little table. Of course, that table isn't a Python table, it's a C table. Are we getting a pattern now? So we wrap the table up into a Python dictionary, which is what this thing here does, mp define const dict. Here is a dictionary, I promise I won't change it. Here's what goes in it, wrap it up for me. And now finally, 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 we declare a module. And we say this module has a base and it has that dictionary is its globals, right? It's, these are the symbols it exports and that is pretty much all the code you need to implement a simple, simple zero argument function in MicroPython. Except for you've just got to tell the make file, uh, the, sorry, the config file here to include that module in your build and you've got to tell the make file where to go find it. That's it. That's, that's literally all the code that's involved. So if you wanted to sit down and write a function for the Hall effect sensor, it would look pretty much like that. It would say take the, the you know, somewhere in mod ESP, write a function that says take a reading from the whole sensor, wrap that reading up into a Python object, now wrap the function that generated that up into a Python function, now put that into the symbol table, now return that. So even though a lot of this stuff probably seems like nonsense, if you look at the code, you can actually see that it follows a pattern and it's actually quite an easy pattern to sort of just iterate on and add things and add things and add things and then eventually we might actually be able to support the whole IDF in MicroPython. So back to the Python side of it, now when you see this where it says import ESP, 
you know what that's really doing. What that's really doing is pulling in that global symbol table we declared before. When we do a dir of ESP, we're iterating over that symbol table and saying, show me all the symbols I put in that list of symbols. When we call a function, we're saying, get me the value of that function. Now call that function. When I call that function, it calls the C function, right? When I call the Python function, it calls the C function side. The C function returns a C int. The C int gets wrapped into a Python int. The Python int comes back to you. We get to print its value on the screen. That's pretty cool. All right. So there are lots of resources out there. There's the, the main repo, which you can go to to look at to, to see where the things are at. Being GitHub, we, we've got active GitHub issues. We've got all of that sort of stuff happening. Um, as I say, please, please, please contribute to issues, to bugs, to whatever, um, including if it's just, I really, really wish MicroPython supported the whole sensor, even if you go, I wish it did, but Nick's presentation has left me no more confident that I could make that happen, then file an issue because it may have left someone else here more confident that they can make that happen and they may fix it for you, which would be great. Um, and that's just resources for the ESP32. All right, um, thank you very much. If questions and comments. Uh, have you looked at using something like Sweet to avoid some of that boilerplate and wrapping C into... Yeah, um, yeah. Um, the boilerplateiness of it is kind of awful. Um, I guess we're trying to keep the thing pretty close to the metal to keep the um, to keep it simple. And it, to be honest, it doesn't get much worse than that. But it wouldn't be a bad idea to look at some more sophisticated build stuff, yeah, just to, to get away from dealing with C macros and... All that sort of stuff. The other thing would be, it would be just great to, I guess, I, I've been looking at an approach where we do a one-to-one -one translation of IDF functions and then wrap that over the top. Because what we want to do is we want to have the, uh, the MicroPython interface be exactly the same across all the platforms. But every platform's SDK is different. And so this is also providing like a translation layer between um, a MicroPython API and the ESP8266 SDK and the 32 IDF and so on, each of which work a bit differently, quite a lot differently in some cases. Uh, but it would actually be quite practical, I think, to have a, an automatic interface of like, you know, underscore machine that automatically gets generated and then put a, uh, a standard machine over the top that calls the sub functions of underscore machine. That's, that's another possible way we could go forward. Pull request welcome. <laughs> cool. Do you have any more questions? No? Okay. Well, cool. thank you, Nick. No worries. Thank you.